Well, that was great, wasn't it? That was good. Good music this morning. Thank you, Kendra. Thank you, Michael and the team. Multi-talented folks, right? Without a doubt. So, yeah. Amen. Well, I don't know about you, but uh, there comes um, a time in our lives when we have been training to do something for a very long time, or maybe an intense short time, and all of a sudden, we are put on the spot and we have to actually perform. We have to actually do it ourselves. Has that ever happened to you? Have you ever been trained? And it seems like the trainer is just training you, and it's so simple and it's so easy. I mean, it's just, just they make it look so simplistic, and then all of a sudden they turn to you and they say, now it's your turn. And, and you look at them and think, how in the world am I going to do this? Has that ever happened to you? I, I remember I was uh, 16 years old, and I was working. Uh, I got a job at Friendly Ice Cream. And Friendly's is actually, it started up in Massachusetts, and it was coming to Cape Cod. It was the first franchise of any sort food-wise in our town. And people were so excited about it. Little town, everybody's talking about it. And the grand opening came. And, and I walked in, uh, and I saw all these cards there, even by the time I got there, and I, I walked in, and the line was a mile long. I mean, just people waiting to get into this place after the place just initially filled. And I wasn't really all that keen on what I was going to be asked to do, but I found out that morning that the two trainers who were in from some other place and the manager decided that I was going to be the cook. I'm an experienced chef. I know how to put milk in my cereal bowl. Do you know what I'm saying? I have no idea about this at all. Have you ever been handed 40 or so orders at the same time? That's what we were looking at. And they began to show me on the spot how to crack open eggs without leaving shells in them, and fry bacon, and do this, and get toast, and English muffins, and oh, they needed this, and oh, they needed that. And they were working like 100 miles an hour, and they were showing me all of these things, and then they looked at me and they said, now you do it. <laughs> Whew, it didn't go so well. In fact, it didn't even last that long. <laughs> If you've ever been trained to do something, there comes that moment in time when all of a sudden you realize you are on the spot. You are the person who has to step in. It is up to you. In the book of Mark, chapter 6, we come to a pivotal time in the ministry of Jesus Christ, where Jesus, who has been doing all of the teaching all along, turns to the disciples once he summoned them to himself and said, now you do it. Would you take your Bibles and open them up if you have a Bible here today uh, and go with me to Mark chapter 6. I'd like to read for you several verses starting in verse 7. And if you'd stand with me, please, uh, I would appreciate it greatly. The Bible says, And he, Jesus, summoned the twelve and began to send them out in pairs. And gave them authority over the unclean spirits, and he instructed them that they should take nothing for their journey except a mere staff. No bread, no bag, no money in their belt, but to wear sandals. And he added, do not put on two tunics. He said to them, wherever you enter a house, stay there until you leave town. Any place that does not receive you or listen to you as you go out from there, shake the dust off the soles of your feet for a testimony against them. And they went out and preached that men should repent, and they were casting out many demons and were anointing with oil many sick people and healing them. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you've brought us together this morning, and we thank you, Father, for this great passage of Scripture. Help us, Lord, as we seek to understand it, to be able to uh, study it from the perspective, Lord, of, of what are you calling us to do? Father, help us to understand the significance of what is happening in this passage so that we can apply it directly to our lives today. Thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. 
Jesus begins this long road of preparation for the disciples by first calling ordinary men to confess him as the true Messiah. And he follows that up with calling them to a permanent following. That is, it's full time, it's leaving behind basically everything that they knew. And then thirdly, here in this passage, we see them prepping for the evangelistic mission that they would be called to do. We're familiar perhaps with Matthew chapter 28, 19 and 20, going into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. This is a short-term evangelistic tour of the surrounding villages that Jesus is about to send these men on. And this is all part of this preparation. As we look at it, we see the compassion of Jesus as Jesus seeks to multiply the messengers so that the message will be heard by more and more people. Now, it's interesting to note here, and it's important for us to note, that this is a, a, an important, pivotal moment, because in verse 14 on down through verse 29, it records there uh, the end of life for John the baptizer. John was the voice crying in the wilderness. He was the one who was preparing the way of the Lord by preaching the doctrine of repentance and calling people to remember that the kingdom of God, i.e. the Messiah, was at hand. Jesus had a very, very impactful ministry as soon as he began, and it was all part of the divine plan to have John come and pave the way in the hearts of the people, conditioning them to understand the significance of repentance. But what is very significant here about Mark chapter 6 is that John is the last of the Old Testament prophets. When you think of an Old Testament prophet, you probably think of someone in sackcloth and ashes going out there like Jonah, repent. Uh, you know, God is, is doing great things as he walks through the city of Nineveh. It's those minor prophets and the major prophets. It's all of those people with the similar message, holding forth the holiness of God. And then you come to John, and John is not much different. He's going to lose his life here in chapter 6, and we're not going to take the time to go through it because we've done it already, but John is one who, because he is simply holding to God's standard of righteousness, he's going to lose his life as well. So this is pivotal. It's pivotal because we're going from looking back towards the Old Testament prophets to those who would exclaim the gospel in the New Testament. We have now the apostles who will take the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. And what does gospel mean? But it means good news. The good news is that Messiah, Jesus, has come to pay the penalty for, sin, for sinful men like you and me. And this testimony of holiness and righteousness is to be upheld by Christ's church. So we come to this verse in verse 7 where Jesus summons the twelve. And the Bible says he began to send them out in pairs. It's a process, and I'm not sure who went with who. The Bible doesn't say, but as we would understand the commissioning, the commissioning goes forward, and he calls them to himself. Luke chapter 9 and verse 2 tells us what they were going to do. He sent them out to specifically proclaim the kingdom of God and to perform some miracles like healing. Jesus sends them out to proclaim. The word proclaim there is the word uh, Caruso, which doesn't mean anything to you, but it means something to me because when I went to Bible college, uh, the old main where the word of God was heralded forth was called Carex, based upon that Greek word. It was about proclaiming, and that's what the apostles were called to do, to come and to proclaim the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. It was an important message that they had. Notice verse 13 tells us there, that, or verse 12, that they went out and preached that men should repent. Why is this so important? Well, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7 says, we have redemption in Christ, in him, through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses. In other words, we can find redemption for our sin because Jesus shed his blood on the cross, and it is that very payment on the cross 
that allows me to be clothed or dressed in the righteousness of Christ and not exposed to a holy God in my sinful condition. That is truly good news. And so the apostles go out and they go out into villages and they tell the people in the villages this great news that Jesus the Messiah has come to die in their place, that they needed to repent. And repentance, as we know, means a change of mind. And what were they changing? They were looking from their own self-righteousness to the righteousness of Jesus Christ. It's the same message of repentance that we need today. Too many of us feel like our own righteousness is good enough. While the Bible teaches that it's nothing at all. There is none righteous, no, not one. All of our righteousnesses are as filthy rags in the sight of God, the Bible says. And so because of our true condition spiritually, we all need the Savior, Jesus Christ, because we need to repent from this false idea that our own righteousness is sufficient to allow me to enter into the kingdom of heaven. It was an important message then, and it's an important message today. Would you agree? You see, it's a, an important step. Up until this point, as I mentioned, Jesus has been doing all the teaching. You could be the disciple, you just kind of long for the ride. I mean, it was a dicey ride at times, right? I mean, you know, you're in the back of the ship, and it's going down, and you're screaming for Jesus to, to, to save you from the sea that's, you know, absolutely swamping the boat. It, it's been dicey. It's been difficult, but what you understand is that you never had to stand up and say anything. You were just along for the ride. So when someone blurted out and they were demon-possessed and they started screaming profanities and you thought, oh, no, you didn't have to deal with it. It wasn't your problem. You looked at Jesus and said, Jesus, there's a problem. And Jesus dealt with it. Now you're going to go out on your own and you're going to be the person and you're going to have to deal with it. And for that, Jesus equips the 12 in a marvelous way. He equips them so that they're able to accomplish the purposes that he has laid out for them. In fact, it's evidenced here in Hebrews chapter 2, uh, verses 3 and 4. How will we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? Uh, after it was at the first spoken through the Lord, it was confirmed to us by those who heard. God also testifying with them both by signs and wonders and various miracles, and by the gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. In the early church, this was very important because it authenticated that these were people who were truly the messengers of God. And these signs and wonders uh, supported the fact that you should listen to them because what they have to say is of tremendous, tremendous significance. They could do all of these different miracles, and they, they did them in such a way as to bring attention to the message that God had prepared for those people in the villages to hear. Now, we know that when they would go out and they would cast demons out, and that was a pretty significant miracle, would you agree? What was the response of the people? Well, the naysayers said that, well, I, you know, there, there's no way to argue when someone is healed. I mean, miraculously healed. What do you do with that? I mean, it's kind of like, well, I really don't want to believe in Jesus. I really don't want to believe that he's Messiah. But what do I do with this reality that there's a miracle here? Well, when it came to casting these unclean spirits, these demonic spirits out of people, people turned around and they pointed at Jesus and they said, well, Jesus... We're not going to deny the fact that you're doing these miracles, but we would suggest that this power that you have is not from God the Father, but from the adversary Satan. And that's where Jesus gives that big warning. He says, whoa, 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 whoa. You dare since do that because if you give credit to Satan for doing those things, you commit the unpardonable sin. Whew. So as these men go out and they, they begin to cast demons out and as they, they're healing the sick, they're doing so with the power of God because they have the authority of God. It was the equipping that Jesus does with them that allows them to go out and do these things. But Jesus also has a protocol for them as they would go out as well. And the protocol really boils down to a couple of things as I see it. 
One is, this is truly a journey of faith. Notice here in your Bible, when Jesus is talking to them, and he says, uh, basically, uh, they should take nothing for the journey. I don't know how long they're going to go, uh, but when you and I go on a trip, we usually pack up a whole bunch of stuff, don't we? I mean, we do. I mean, we got way more stuff than we need. Uh, we go away for three days, and we have 14 days worth of clothes. Like, what is going to happen that I need these, right? I mean, but we have to bring all this stuff. And, and what Jesus is saying to these people is, listen, guys, you're not taking any of that stuff. You can't even take two coats. Well, what about rain? I don't care. One coat, that's all you get. Take your staff. You might have to fend off, uh, you know, a wild dog or something. Uh, I don't know. Uh, but you can take no money with you. No money. Zero money. Zero credit cards. Zero anything. You're just going to go. You're going to walk up to that village. And you're going to go there to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. At different times, there will be permission to take other things along. This is not suggesting here that a vow of poverty for the disciples was normative or anything like that. This is a training mission that they are on, this short-term missions trip that I have no idea how long would even take. But the point is this, upon going upon this journey, they needed to have total faith and reliance on God. And that, my friends, is training, isn't it? There is something about living life dependent upon God's provision that builds us and builds our character and our deep trust in him like nothing else. They could have easily been granted by Jesus all the denarii they need. Here, here's, here's a bag for you. Here's a bag for you. Here, here you go. And uh, I know cars aren't invented yet, uh, but you might need four-wheel drive where you're going. So, whoop, here they come, you know. I mean, Jesus could have prepared a camel. He could have prepared a horse. He could have prepared anything at all. He could have given them dirt bikes, for crying out loud, with gas tanks that never ran out. But he doesn't. He says, you go and you go totally dependent on me. And that is exactly how they're going to go. This is a journey of faith. Faith is what we need in serving the Lord Jesus Christ. And faith doesn't come easily. It's a process. It's a process of being able to, to trust the Lord when times are good, when times aren't so good. Isn't it true? It's being able to exalt Christ and learning how to exalt Christ even in the midst of the storm. This is a process that these disciples have been on and it's not an easy process, but it is a necessary process. Just a little bit here on the journey that's focused on ministry. This is a journey that without a doubt is, has ministry written all over it. And Jesus is going to give some curious things here, and I'll just point this out quickly to us. There's a couple of things here, actually. He said to them, whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave town. Stay there until you leave town. Don't, don't go from house to house. Isn't that a curious thing to say? Here's what would happen. The false teachers, the people that were out for themselves, who really didn't care that much about ministry, would ultimately go from house to house depending on who had the nicest house. Makes sense. When these people, even the disciples, walked into a village and people found out that they could heal the sick, how popular do you think they became? Pretty popular. Everybody knows somebody who's sick. Everybody who know, knows someone who could use a touch from this miracle worker. And so, listen, you come and stay at my house. Wherever these disciples would have gone, the community would have gathered around the outside of the home, just as they did with Jesus. They would have miracles being done. They would then listen to the message. And so it's very, very similar to what is going on with Jesus. But they would become very popular. You know, you healed my uncle the other day, and uh, did I tell you we have a house that's near the water? Did, did I tell you I have the best cooks in town? Uh, you need to come over here and stay with me. And what Jesus tells him is, no, you stay wherever the first house is, that's where you stay. If it happens to be the nicest house in town, great. If it's the worst, that's fine too, but you don't move. 
because I want you to be different from the false teachers. I want you to be purely motivated by ministry. It has to come down to ministry and not anything else. In fact, as we'll see, these people were totally dependent on God. Notice what he says here that, and I'm going to go down to verse 13 again, they were casting out many demons and they were anointing them with oil and many sick people and healing them. They were anointing with oil many sick people. So this is a big, big thing that they're doing here. But I want to point out something that's kind of interesting about the oil. Jesus, it's never said, ever uh, used oil to anoint someone with. And yet the apostles do that. Olive oil sometimes was used as a medicinal, uh, had a medicinal value. Luke chapter 10, Luke being a physician, so forth, mentions it in Luke chapter 10. But it's not the purpose here as these 12 disciples go out. Uh, they are not anointing so that somehow that oil would help people feel better. It's very, very different here. You see, in the Old Testament, olive oil was used to symbolize God's presence. And so it was used to anoint people like priests and kings. And it was to say that God was then with them. The disciples are using oil to demonstrate that they had God-given authority to heal the sick. In other words, they were saying, God is the source of our power. The source of our power is not ourselves. It's all about God. The message that we have, we didn't dream up or come up with on our own. This is God's message of redemption. And the miracles that are being done, cannot, I cannot take credit for these miracles that are being done. They pointed directly to God all the time, taking no glory for themselves like the false teachers would be apt to do. You and I serve the Lord, we do it the same way. You and I are instruments in following Jesus. No one here, no one anywhere is accomplishing things on their own for God. I want to make that really clear. We are all sinners saved by grace. And you may be here this morning and you've yet to place your faith in Jesus Christ. But understand that if you call upon the name of the Lord and he saves you from your sin, you are one among many who are saved by the grace of God and not through any works that you have done. Are we really clear on that? You see, as we serve Jesus Christ, we serve him in the abilities that he's given to us. In fact, none of us have anything on our own to offer God. Nothing. It's all about God all the time. Everything we do comes because God has equipped us to do that. And so here they were, ordinary men doing extraordinary things because God was using them as a tool to accomplish his purposes. Now, the ministry of the 12 is very important to understand because the ministry of the 12 is all about training. And that training aspect would really take on huge significance, for instance, when Jesus ascends to heaven, okay? When Jesus ascends to heaven, all of a sudden you realize, ooh, uh, hmm, now, how, now who do we ask if we have a question, right? As I began to scramble those eggs as fast as I could that morning, that fateful morning, I realized that this was way over my head, and finally someone literally picked me up and threw me into the kitchen. It was over. And I realized then why they threw me into the kitchen. I've never seen more dirty dishes in my entire life. And there was no one back there cleaning them. You talk about having a plan. There wasn't one. And I began to wash dishes, and I washed dishes for hours because people don't like to get their eggs served on a plate that already has dried eggs on it, right? It was all part of training. It was all part of developing a relationship for the disciples with God. They needed to have faith in Jesus to a degree that they had not yet met that level and they were coming to the point where they were realizing this is really about understanding what God can do through a human being. It was about training. 
Acts chapter 4 and verse 13 is just a really cool verse of scripture. And I don't think I have it on this slide. No. It says this. When they observed the boldness of Peter and John, and realized that they were uneducated and untrained men. This is talking about the religious leaders in Acts chapter 4. They're looking at Peter and John. They see their boldness. They realize, hey, these guys don't have degrees from anywhere, and they're untrained. They were amazed and recognized, and here's the last part, that they had been with Jesus. That they had been with Jesus. What sets you and I apart from the world? The world should see, should they not, that we've been with Jesus. You and I are called to a very, very important role today. The church desperately needs to continue the pattern of evangelism. Notice there, if you jump across to verse 30, the apostles gathered together with Jesus and they reported to him all that they had done and taught. That must have been quite a fun meeting to be at, wouldn't you agree? Oh, Jesus, you should have heard this one. Oh, you should have seen this. And they brought me this sick person. And oh, this guy, he had demons. And oh, man, whoo, that was exciting. And Jesus said, calm down. <laughs> he says, come away by yourselves to a secluded place. And you guys need to relax. That's ministry. That's the excitement of ministry. You and I are still called to minister the gospel of Jesus Christ. Who will minister if we fail to do so? Who will evangelize if the church today doesn't do it? We recognize that there is a tremendous need to share our faith today. And the church in America is not doing a good job at it. We're just not. It's almost like we're not really programmed to even think that way. To think that the world that we're in is a vast mission field. Jesus said this. He said to them in verse 10, whenever you enter a house, stay there till you leave town. And any place that doesn't receive you or listen to you as you go out from there, Shake the dust off the soles of your feet for a testimony against them. When the Jewish folks would leave Israel, Palestine, they, they'd go off into Gentile lands where they were just in some area that was unclean. When they came back to what was clean, they would ceremoniously shake off the dust from their garment and stomp their feet so as to say, we have left the pagan land and we have come to a land that's clean our land. They did it in a very proud way. And Jesus used that, as that same exact judgment so that when the disciples are giving the gospel, if someone rejects Jesus, they're basically to do the same thing. And it was a testimony to those people, a testimony that they would understand the significance behind. You and I live in a world where people are rejecting Jesus all the time. And people are dying and going to hell. And many of them have never even heard about Jesus right here in the U.S. of A. Many people today have changed their traditional orthodox view. And it's not gone unnoticed. There are three uh, researchers, one's uh, by the name of Christian Smith, George Barna, you've heard of him, David Kinneman, who's uh, done a lot of writing as well. All of these independently concluded that the majority of young evangelicals are not able to articulate their faith. Now understand this, in Acts chapter 4, when the religious leaders looked at Peter, James, and John, they looked at these guys and said, man, we're amazed at these fellows because they're untrained and they're uneducated. They didn't have advanced degrees in evangelism when Jesus sent them out in Mark chapter 6. He just said, you go out there and tell people. Tell people that they need to repent, that they need to turn their hearts towards God. Tell them that I am the Messiah who has come, the long-awaited Messiah. 
Just tell them that. And I would say to you this morning that the gospel message hasn't gotten much harder than that over the years. We're still able to go out and tell people about the love of Jesus Christ. Would you agree? We're still charged with the responsibility of, of telling them that they're on their way to hell without Christ. It's not something that you need a degree in advanced anything to be able to do that. Would you agree with that? Just go out and tell them what they need to hear. And what's so concerning about Christianity in today's day and age is that if the majority of young evangelicals are not able to articulate their faith, then how do we spread the gospel message? When we know that faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Scott, Barna, Kinneman, all did this research independently and came to the same conclusion. And it was Smith in his book called Soul Searching, where he writes that the common creed among American evangelical teens is moralistic therapeutic deism. That sounds like a big word, and it is, right? It's three words. Moralistic therapeutic deism. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't know what that is. So I looked it up on Wikipedia like anybody else. And there it was. And it isn't good. Al Mohler writes a, in his blog, he writes an article about this, and he says, as described by Smith and his team, moralistic therapeutic deism consists of beliefs like this. Now, I want to remind you that this was done, three different independent researchers did this, and it's not among non-church kids, it's among Christian, quote-unquote, evangelicals in evangelical churches, just like Faith Community Church. That's what makes it so sobering. Smith describes moralistic therapeutic deism. Say it three times fast. Here's the belief. A God exists who created and ordered the world and watches over human life on earth. If you know much about deism, you could extrapolate from that the whole thing. Number two, God wants people to be good, nice, and fair to each other as taught in the Bible in most world religions. Oh, okay. The central goal of life is to be happy and to feel good about oneself. Number four, God does not need to be particularly involved in one's life except when God is needed to resolve a problem. Where is that genie bottle? I left it here somewhere. And the last one, which is heart-wrenching, says good people go to heaven when they die. I don't believe the gospel is based upon good works. Moeller goes on to say, consider, consider this remarkable assessment. Other more accomplished scholars in these areas will have to examine and evaluate these possibilities in greater depth, but we can say here that we've come with some confidence to believe that a significant part of Christianity in the U.S. is actually only tenuously Christian in any sense that is seriously connected to the actual historical Christian tradition, but is rather substantially morphed into Christianity's misbegotten step-cousin, Christian moralistic therapeutic deism. They argue that this, distor this distortion of Christianity has taken root not only in the minds of individuals, but also within, get this, within the structures of at least some Christian organizations and institutions. How can you tell, he says, the language and therefore experience of things like the Trinity, holiness, sin, grace, justification, sanctification, church, and heaven and hell appear among most Christian teenagers in the United States at the very least to be supplanted by the language of happiness, niceness, and an earned heavenly reward. This radical transformation of Christian theology and Christian belief replaces the sovereignty of God with the sovereignty of the self. In this particular, in this therapeutic age, human problems are reduced to pathologies in need of treatment. Sin is simply excluded from the picture and doctrines as central as the wrath and justice of God are discarded as out of step with the times and unhelpful to the project of self-actualization. 
All this means is that teenagers have been listening carefully. They've been observing their parents in the larger culture with diligence and insight. And they understand just how little their parents really believe and just how much many of their churches and Christian institutions have accommodated themselves to the dominant culture. This research project demands the attention of every thinking Christian. Those who are prone to dismiss sociological analysis as irrelevant will miss the point. We must now look at the United States of America as missiologists once viewed nations that had never heard the gospel. Indeed, our missiological challenge may be even greater than the confrontation with paganism, for we face a succession of generations who have transformed Christianity into something that bears no resemblance to the faith revealed in the Bible. The faith once delivered to the saints is no longer even known, not only by American teenagers, but most of their parents. Millions of Americans believe they are Christians simply because they have some historic tie to a Christian denomination or identity. To that I would say, wow. Wow. You and I are called upon to take the word of God to a world that desperately needs to hear it. How fitting it is this morning that our music was all about taking the gospel to a world that doesn't know Christ. How fitting it is that we're praying for each other to be the ones who are sowing the seed of the gospel. It's never been with more urgency that we've needed the gospel of Jesus Christ in a culture. Would you agree with that? If this is indeed true and these observations are correct, our own land right here, the villages in which we live, are desperately in need of the pure gospel of Jesus Christ. Will you be a messenger for Christ? Will you multiply the message of the great gospel of Jesus Christ. We are saved so that we might be that messenger. Jesus has called every believer into service and he has equipped every single one of us for the specific purposes that he's intended. He equipped the 12, they went out, they could do miracles. You say, well, I can't heal anybody, I can't do those miracles. He's given to you the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit of God takes the word of God and It goes deep into the hearts of individuals. The word of God is as powerful today as it's ever been. Jesus has promised to go with each one of us. And that is a promise that we should take to heart. Every one of us is going to leave this auditorium today. We're going to go into this world Will there be opportunities in the week ahead for some of us to be able to share our faith? I hope so. I know so. God wants us to do that so that the next generation can hear the truth of the gospel. Will you be part of that? I trust that you will. Let's pray, shall we? we just take a moment to look into our own hearts and lives this morning, let me encourage you to be honest with yourself. Do you know Christ as your Savior, or are you clinging to your self-righteousness? It's almost as simple as that. You're depending upon your own good works, hoping that they're sufficient so that you can enjoy the kingdom of heaven. Or have you come to the point to realize that you have a need, a spiritual need, for a Savior? If that's where you are, then the only true Savior is Jesus. And he will forgive you of your sin. I wonder today how many of us who have heard that gospel message and placed our faith in Christ because we heard it, I wonder how many of us are just holding on to it and keeping it for ourselves and not sharing it with others. I believe his point about being a mission-oriented Christian is vital. We need to see ourselves like that. 
the opportunities are there, but if we don't think of ourselves as mission-oriented, we'll let those opportunities go by. God's speaking to your heart right now. I trust that you'll follow him. If you'd like more information about placing your faith in Christ, we have folks that'll be here at the front after the service who would love to show you how you can know that you have eternal life. Don't leave here until you talk to someone. Would you all stand with me, please? Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for the gospel message. For in it, Lord, we see the compassion of our great God, delivering to us redemption through Jesus Christ and him alone. Work in our hearts today. Help us, Father, to be your messenger. Help us, Father, today to follow you wherever you lead us. May we truly be people dependent upon you. Work in our hearts and lives, I pray, Father. As we ask all these things in Jesus' name, amen. As you're going uh, out this morning, there's a table.